Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Stand Up. I'm here with you every day, and I'm very happy that you are joining me, especially those of you who join me on a regular basis. So happy to have all of you here. I've got the great Liz Winstead as my guest today. She, of course, the co-creator of The Daily Show, stand-up comedian and activist, probably one of the most respected activists when it comes to women's reproductive rights in the country and has been for a long time. We have a great, great conversation, and if you want to skip the news to get to that conversation right Right now, it begins at 29 minutes, but I've got a very robust news segment for you. I have chosen a wonderful array of audio clips for you to hear, so I really hope that you stay for it and enjoy it. I also hope that you'll join me tomorrow night at 7 p.m. because that is an hour before the big debate starts. It's the first presidential debate between Biden and Trump. Maybe the only one. Maybe it won't happen at all. Some people think Trump won't show up. I'll be hosting a watch party starting at 7 p.m. If you're a paid subscriber, you'll get the link to join me. And if you're not, start now. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Got a couple of new subscribers, a couple of people editing their pledge up. Mindy Cunningham, you are so very generous. Thank you very, very much. You have been so supportive to me, as have so many of you, and I am eternally grateful. All right, so we got the hangout on Thursday night. I'm on my way to West Virginia, Shepherdstown, to the federal government Fish and Wildlife National Conservation Training Center to be a part of NICALC. I think this will be almost 10 times that I've gone to the Native Youth Climate Adaptation Leadership Congress, and it's a really exciting opportunity for me to be able to communicate with them, tell their stories. And uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to these young tribal folks, native high school and college age youth. And it's a very, very good conservation leadership training. And I'm psyched to be involved and to be talking to them. I'll be doing that. And then I'm not sure about Thursday's show, if it will be delivered to you on time or not. It all depends on how busy I get at the conference, whether I can turn it around. So be patient with me on that. But now it's time to get to the... The news, your headlines. I scan dozens of news websites, social media websites, corporate sites, independent content creators for you all day. And I come up with the stories that I think are the most impactful to the most people. And then I I read them uh, here. I gather them and I make notes and I read them to you each and every day. So let's get to it. Yesterday. Let's see. Yesterday in Nairobi, Kenya is where we will start. Part of Kenya's parliament building was on fire as thousands of protest against, protesters against the new finance bill entered and legislators fled in the most direct assault on the government in decades. Journalists saw at least three bodies outside the complex where police had opened fire. So uh, chaos in Kenya over that new law. They don't like the tax bill. I don't know anything about it. I shouldn't say anything more about it. And now let's go to the Donald Trump's gag order in the hush money case. Judge Juan Mershon has tweaked the gag order, lifting restrictions on Trump's ability to comment on the witnesses who testified against him during this trial, as well as part of the order barring him from discussing the jury that convicted him. The ruling left in place a part of the order barring Trump from going after court staff, individual prosecutors and family members of any council staff member of the court or the district attorney. I'm not sure why exactly, but that is news from yesterday. So I shared it with you. Now, more than 500 people have been charged with federal crimes under the gun safety law that President Biden signed. That's right. This is a good thing. Some linked to transnational cartels and organized crime rings have been charged with gun trafficking and other crimes under the landmark gun safety legislation that President Joe Biden signed two years ago this Tuesday. That is a good thing. Let's be happy about it. And speaking of the White House, a report obtained by the Associated Press on the implementation of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act also said The enhanced background checks under the new law have stopped roughly 800 sales of firearms to people under the age of 21 who would be prohibited from buying them. It highlights that 14 states are using or planning to use funding from the legislation to make better use of red flag laws, which allow law enforcement to remove weapons from people in crisis but are often underused or not well understood. And the report lays out how $85 million in funding has been awarded to 125 school districts across 18 states to help identify students who need mental health care and can help access them. That is action, folks. That is really important, and it's not the kind of story that gets reported and celebrated enough. 
Well, a federal judge on Monday temporarily barred the Education Department from allowing additional loan forgiveness under a key component of President Joe Biden's student debt relief plan. See, he's not a dictator. He tries to make these things happen through executive order. He's passed far less executive orders than the predecessor, the disgraced former president. But this judge's order halted the cancellation of federal student loans under the income-driven repayment plan known as SAVE after several states sued over the program. So important to uh, take a look at that story if you're affected by it. And this is big. In a landmark an- announcement yesterday, the U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy declared firearm violence a public health crisis in the nation. He warned the advisory in an advisory that the gun violence poses a serious threat to the health and well-being of our country. And that's not just a serious physical toll, but a mental one as well. And I've got audio of him coming up. He was on MSNBC. I'll share some of that. Moving on, a U.S. bankruptcy court trustee is planning to shut down the evil conspiracy theorist Alex Jones, the worst guy in the country, one of the worst guys in the country. His awful InfoWars media platform might be done for good and liquidating it and its assets to help pay the $1.5 billion in lawsuit judgment that Alex Jones owes for repeatedly calling the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting a hoax. And that is more good news. Here's some fascinating lunar research from the moon and a global first. China's Chang-6 probe returned to Earth yesterday with rock and soil samples from little explored far side of the moon. While past U.S. and Soviet missions have collected samples from the moon's near side, the Chinese mission was the first to collect samples from the far side. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there and what they found. In Gaza, half a million people are facing starvation because of a catastrophic lack of food, according to a a group of global experts saying yesterday. Israel's top Supreme Court delivered a blow to Netanyahu's coalition unanimously. Uh, he said today that the military must begin drafting ultra-Orthodox Jewish men. The decision threatens Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's fragile wartime coalition, which relies on secular members who oppose the exemption and ultra-Orthodox parties that support it. All nine judges agreed on the Israeli Supreme Court that there's no legal basis for the military exemption. The issue, long a source of tension has only grown more heated as the war in Gaza has required tens of thousands of reservists to serve multiple tours, costing the lives of hundreds of soldiers. All right, a few more headlines. The Oklahoma Supreme Court blocked what was set to become the nation's first religious charter school. Julian Assange flew to the U.S. Commonwealth, U.S. Commonwealth in the Pacific Ocean, Mariana Islands, I believe. He's set to plead guilty and a felony to be released From a British prison under a deal with the U.S., everybody was following him around yesterday. We saw reporting of him getting on a plane, getting off the plane. I don't know what your feelings are on him. The first wave of 2,500 member international force landed in the Caribbean nation of Haiti, put a stop to rampant gang violence. That's big news. In Russia, the International Criminal Court issued arrest warrants for two senior security officials accused of directing strikes against Ukrainian civilian targets. Hmm. Well, that's good news. And in France, many voters once considered the far-right national rally too extreme to be anywhere close to power, and now the party could win in upcoming elections, a report from the New York Times that I wanted to mention because we were talking about that with Bill Boyle the other day. And those are your headlines. Now it's time to get to the – oh, wait, here's one more headline. I thought this was interesting. More than two decades' worth of content published on mtbnews.com, apparently no longer available after MTB appears to fully pull down the site and its related content. A lot of people were very upset about that yesterday. And, yeah, the headline, MTB News website goes dark, archives pulled offline. So I wanted to mention that one as well. Now I'm done with your headlines. Now it's time to get to those audio clips, starting with Lady Gaga. This is a little mashup. It's got music behind it, but I'm not sure where it's from. But I saw it for the first time yesterday, and I thought I would share it, and it would be a good way to start the audio segment. And to all the women and all the men with daughters and sisters and mothers Everybody, no matter how you identify, now is your chance to vote against Donald Trump, a man who believes his fame gives him the right to grab one of your daughters or sisters or mothers or wives by any part of their bodies. We need you. We need your family. We need your friends. We need your heart. Vote like your life depends on it. 
or vote like your children's lives depend on it. Because they do. Right now is time for action. It's time to muster all of our energy, every ounce of us, every ounce of hope and optimism and enthusiasm, every ounce of fear and frustration and discouragement. Now is the time to show up and vote like this country depends on it because it does. All right. Lady Gaga, like I said, I'm not sure exactly where that's from, uh, but I wanted to open with that because I thought that was uh, moving and inspiring. Now let's head over to CNN where Boris Sanchez had the Biden campaign spokeswoman, Adrian Elrod, on. He asked her uh, about these requests or demands that President Biden take a drug test before tomorrow night's debate. One last question, Adrian. President, uh, former President Trump asking president biden for a drug test going into thursday night what's your reaction i mean i don't even really know what to say about that i worked on hillary clinton's campaign you know she also debated him very effectively he accused her of being on drugs uh uh, president biden defeated donald trump twice (laughs) in in previous debates this is what he does because he doesn't have anything else to run on he doesn't have a plan he doesn't have a record uh, for fighting for the American people. He doesn't know why he's running except for to seek political retribution on his enemies. And so he has to resort to these types of tactics, which are frankly just silly, turns off a lot of voters, especially voters who want to see their president fight for them. Adrian Elrod, we have to leave the conversation there. Appreciate the perspective. Thanks Thank for being you. with us. All right, there you go. So that's what she thinks uh, about that. We'll see if uh, that narrative can, keeps up, continues. Who is... Trump going to invite. Oh, no, there is no audience. It's going to say, who is he going to invite in the audience to distract distract President Biden? What's he going to do? It's going to be fascinating and terrifying at the same time. They're covering it all over the world. I think they're going to be on Australia News to talk about it as well. Now, let's go to I thought this was interesting uh, over the Midas Touch dot com. They had a, a guy who voted for Donald Trump twice named Kyle Sweetser on and he is no longer a supporter. Apparently hard to believe he ever was with this analysis, but still. The longer you stare at Trump and his record, the worse it gets. So, you know, Trump's cozying up to, to foreign, uh, basically adversaries. He's, uh, oddly enough, some people don't like me saying this, but he's less conservative than, than Biden on fiscal responsibility. He added eight trillion to the debt, uh, even with, without COVID. Uh, he's not fiscally responsible. He gave people a license to, to act bad out in, out in the open. And I think that the MAGA movement just needs to be destroyed. When I think any rational person that starts listening to Trump instead of d- directly, instead of having someone else regurgitate what Trump says, I think if you listen to Trump and then you listen to Biden, uh, speak, it's night and day. There's no comparison. Uh, Trump is unhinged and he's just not fit to lead. Certainly not fit to be uh, the president of the United States. Wow. Pretty convincing. I wonder if anybody will be turned by him, if he's turned anybody or if he really did vote for Donald Trump twice. What do you think? All right. Now let's go back to CNN. It's Abby Phillips talking with activist and actress Ashley Judd, who I think is very poignant, articulate, and inspiring here, talking about women's reproductive rights and the threats, the continued threats posed by a possible re-election of Donald Trump and the the rest of the cartoon villains he would support to the high court already filled with ayatollahs. We have a debate coming uh, on Thursday. It's a big debate. It'll be right here on CNN. Um, How do you think this is going to play in that debate? How big of a showcase do you think it will be or should be, especially for President Biden uh, going into that contest with uh, Donald Trump? Look, it's really clear that the only candidates running for president who support girls and women's right to plan and space the births of their children and to terminate a pregnancy if that's what they need to do, it's the Biden-Harris ticket. You know, President Trump has said that watching us die from lack of access to abortion care because he vowed to, you know, appoint Supreme Court justices who would overturn a constitutional abortion has been, quote, a beautiful thing to watch. That's really clear. And what I want to emphasize is that 
abortion care is really about stories and it's about us. And even though I'm absolutely voting for Biden Harris, I am campaigning for them. They are the path forward for American democracy. 87% of media articles that were reviewed never quote a doctor when talking about abortion. 92% don't even include a woman who's had an abortion. This is needs to be taken out of the realm of politics and put wha- where it belongs, which is in the lives of women. All right. There you go, Ashley Judd. Well done. Uh, let's head back to, well, stay with CNN. It's Anderson Cooper talking to Maggie Haberman. I don't really think it's worth a, really speculating too much. I've asked one question to a few guests about what they think is going to happen at the debate. But I will take two minutes to hear from Maggie Haberman because she knows very well. She lives in Trump's head and has great sources. And I thought this analysis was pretty good. I saw it. I liked it. I'm sharing it with you. He has no shame and he makes stuff up, but it's very inconsistent. I mean, it's one moment it's he's a worthy debater and then it's he's going to be doing massive amounts of cocaine. Yeah, it's it's a microcosm of the Donald Trump uh, and his team that we have seen over nine years now, which is his team wants him to do one thing. He does something else. And he sometimes can stick to the script, but then he goes off of it, which is why predictions of how he is going to actually be in this debate are probably not worth very right. much. We know that he has been preparing for this debate in in the way he does with sort of policy sessions as opposed to classic, you know, behind the podium matches. Um, but whether he is going to absorb what he's learning there and whether he is going to come in, you know, interrupting President Biden less than he did in 2020 in their first debate it is an open question because he does what he wants to do. I, want, I just want to play something else he said at the rally over the weekend. How should I handle him? Should I be tough and nasty? Yeah. Or should I be... Should I be... She said, no. Should I be tough and nasty and just say you're the worst president in history? Or should I be nice and calm and let him speak? I mean, do you think... Does he sort of change in the moment just riffing how he feels in the moment, or is it something he kind of thinks of as he's going to bed that night and, and just thinks in his head, doesn't tell anybody else? I think, some, some, I think sometimes he plays around with these things on his own. I think sometimes, as you see, he poll tests it because he thinks it's going to please whatever crowd he's in front of. Whatever's on his mind is often what he does with these crowds, and it could be anything. It could be, you know, he's been poll testing everyone about VP at various fundraisers, and this is along the same lines. I was thinking, though, as he was saying that, I think he will be both. I think he will likely interrupt less because I think that's the the main lesson he took from the last debate or their first debate in 2020. And I think he will be very mean toward Biden. I, I will be very surprised if he's anything other than that. I think that's probably more than fair and accurate. And we probably all could have given that analysis. So hmm, maybe I don't need to play it. All right. Now, here is the LinkedIn CEO. This is Reed Hoffman uh, talking about the business community and who they support for president. You hear the MSNBC music coming up, but this is originally on CNN. If the only things about being pro-business were regulation and taxes, then you go, okay, great. It's it's whoever goes lower regulation, lower taxes. The rule of law is what has made America very special. Um, it has made an environment for business that has been spectacular, a, a glowing beacon to the entire world. It's the trust that other countries have in us and our system and how we interact, which allows our industries to export and allows the dollar to be the reserve world currency of the world. And that's the reason why Biden is fundamentally, no matter what, more pro-business than Trump. Yes, businesses care about certainty. They care about the social fabric of the country. They don't like trade wars and all of the things that Trump has wrought. So there's a big Axios report. That's where a lot of this is coming from this week. And there is a New York Times op-ed written by this guy, uh, Joe Sonnenfeld, I think his name is Jeffrey Sonnenfeld. And here he is on MSNBC. And Donnie Deutsch is on with him, and he references Donnie twice. But I thought this was also great analysis on this issue. But I will say it's incredible that no Fortune 100 CEO, it goes, this is going back over a century, going from William Howard Taft, obviously, through through Calvin Coolidge or, uh, you know, Herbert Hoover or uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, the Bushes, uh, of course, uh, your friend and mine, John, the late John McCain and the George W. Bush. To have a break like this is incredible. The business community has always been there by a at least 50 percent or so, roughly r- around there, supporting. And they don't in this candidate. They've walked away from him. Now, uh, there were times where they, in fact, dramatically walked away in August of 2017 when uh, the equating the uh, white supremacists with the peaceful uh, anti 
uh, racial uh, hostile uh, demonstrators in Charlottesville that uh, that the first time in American history that we saw the business community refuse a call to action by the commander in chief that they all these three advisory councils dissolved. They, they left and never came back. But some of the headlines that said oh, business leaders are flocking back. No, that's false. And they had never flocked there in the first place. In 2005, when Donnie was still with the uh, with the apprentice, Donnie, sorry, but about three months <laughs> after you, you, I think it was um, I think it was February. Donnie did oh, I think it was Dub Shope or something. Is uh, you had they had the they had the finality right after the finality because I was critiquing each episode of The Apprentice for the Wall Street Journal, and he was getting madder and madder. And of course, surprise, surprise, threatening to sue me. I brought him by one of our CEO summits, and a lot of the people who seem to be celebrating Trump now. At least the CEOs that were there said, if he walks in the room, we're walking out. We we're at the Waldorf. The big shots, in fact, did walk out when he walked in. They were never with yeah. him. They were never supporting him. And exactly what they, you said, they don't like wedge issues. They're not isolationists. They're, they're, they're not protectionists. They're not xenophobes. And they believe in the, the rule of law, not the, the law of rulers. All right. There you go. I thought that was great. So hopefully you appreciated that one. You're going to love this. It's like three minutes of Ali Mistal. He was on with Ari Melber, also on MSNBC. And he explained basically how crazy the next couple of days at the court are going to be, especially and most importantly, the decision on Trump's immunity or the president being immune from committing crimes. I thought this was great. And really, really, it's always he's always awesome. Here's three minutes with Ali Mistal. How do you brace for and look at these upcoming cases this week? Is it, is it a matter of finally reading the Constitution and whether there can be a federal trial of a former president? Is it about uh, applying text and law? Or do you see something more political afoot? Oh, it's it's yes, I see something more political afoot. I brace for it with, you know, the copious amounts of my my liquor cabinet. Right. Because when you say that it's been 60 days since the Supreme Court heard oral arguments um, in the Trump immunity case, you know as well as anybody else that that's that's the generous timeline here, right? Because Jack Smith initially asked the Supreme Court to make a ruling on this very issue on December 11th of 2023, all right? So we are long beyond uh, uh, the, the bounds at which we thought that we could get a decision on, on, on this critical issue facing the nation. But they didn't decide it on December 11th. They didn't decide it um, in a timely manner. Instead, instead, this court is going to release a decision about whether or not Donald Trump is immune from prosecution, either the day before the presidential debate, the day of the presidential debate, or the day after the presidential debate to step on the news cycle from the presidential debate. You can't get more political than that. It's not like the court doesn't understand how a calendar works, which is why I believe Trump has already won. Again, when I say we're just waiting for the shouting, Trump has already accomplished what he set out to accomplish with this ridiculous immunity argument. The, the, what he was trying to do hmm. was delay his trial until after the election. And now, no matter what the Supreme Court says on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, that trial is now effectively delayed until after the election. They could completely reject his immunity claims. I don't think they are. They could completely reject them, though, and his trial will still be delayed until after the election. I still think the leader in the clubhouse is that they will remand the case back to the uh, back to the trial court, saying that Trump is immune from some actions, but not all actions. And who can know what actions they are? It's actually going to go through an entire another hearing that has to be appealed to the D.C. Circuit and then appealed again um, to the Supreme Court. And maybe sometime this time next year, if Trump loses we will get a decision that will allow a trial against Donald Trump for his actions on January 6th to take place. But that requires Trump losing at the ballot again. He has already won his key uh, his key point, which was to be allowed to run for reelection before facing criminal charges for January 6th. All right. He's always on fire. So good. Ellie Mistal. And it's scary what's going to happen in the next 48 hours. But I'll be here with you to talk it all through at the Hangout, as well as with Eric Siegel and others over the weekend. But now let's get to one more very important clip. This is the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy. He was on MSNBC with Anna Cabrera. I mentioned this new guidance that he put out about uh, gun violence and how much it is a public health issue. 
So this is a big deal that he's doing this. And let's listen. This morning, the U.S. Surgeon General declaring gun violence a public health crisis. In a new advisory, Dr. Vivek Murthy noted gun violence is the leading cause of death for children in the U.S. and says there needs to be a collective commitment to turn the tide of firearm violence. Writing, quote, a public health approach can guide our strategy and actions as it has done in the past with successful efforts to address tobacco related disease and motor vehicle crashes. Now, this comes just a week after the Surgeon General called for tobacco style warning labels on social media platforms. Joining us now, U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy. Dr. Murthy, thank you so much for taking the time. Why are you calling for this now? And I, gun violence has become a public health crisis in America, and it's one that's having far-reaching consequences for millions of Americans. The highest price that we pay for gun violence are the lives that we lose, nearly 50,000 a year. But we also know that for every one person who loses their life, there are two who are injured to gun violence. There are others who witness these incidents, family members who lose a loved one. Uh, there are millions of others who listen and hear about gun violence each and every day. That has led to a collective trauma in our country where now six out of 10 people are worried about losing a loved one to gun violence. More than half of our kids are worried about a shooting in school. But perhaps most importantly, and I, this is really important to me as a parent, gun violence has now become the leading cause of death among children and teens. That was not true a decade ago. It was not true two decades ago. It is true today. So gun violence has become a kid's issue. It has become a source of trauma to the bodies and minds of millions of Americans. But it is a public health issue that merits a public health approach. And we've taken public health approaches to challenges like tobacco, car accident-related deaths over the years. And we've been able to reduce the toll of those public health challenges. We can do the same thing here with gun violence, and it's urgent that we do so. All right. A lot of scary headlines, a lot of scary clips. Let's get to some comedy, shall we? So Jimmy Kimmel is off. He's got sub hosts, which I love. And how about this? Marty Short, Martin Short in the chair. And here is a little bit from his monologue. And I thought it was hilarious. It's Martin Short in for Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Kimmel live on ABC. Make us laugh, boss. Donald Trump says he's close to announcing his running mate and has reportedly narrowed it down to three people. It was four, but O.J. died, so. (laughs) What a choice. Trump has in his tiny little hands. There's Doug Burgum, the governor of North Dakota. He once said that he wouldn't do business with Trump. Doug Burgum sounds like the name of your most annoying co-worker. Oh, great, look who's calling. It's Doug Burgum from a county. Then we have Senator Marco Rubio from Florida. He called Trump a con artist. Or should we go to doormat number three? (laughs) Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, who said he thought Trump was either a cynical (laughs) like Nixon or America's Hitler. (laughs) When have you ever said something like that about someone and then changed your mind? (laughs) Now, even though Trump knows who he's going to choose, he hasn't informed the winner yet. Gosh, it's fun to have a secret, isn't it? here because Jimmy Kimmel knows one of mine (laughs) involving a hitchhiker on the 101 in 1982. (laughs) Trump is also gearing up for the big debate Thursday. Uh, He's trying to manage expectations with claims that Joe Biden will be on drugs. So a little before debate time, he gets a shot in the ass and that's they want to strengthen him up. So he comes out, he'll come out, I, okay, I say he'll come out all jacked up, right? All jacked up. Yes, all, all jacked up on extra strength Metamucil. Uh. <laughs> He's something, that Trump. He says he wants them both to submit to a drug test before the debate. Do you have any idea how long it takes to get a urine sample from men who are close to 80? <laughs> 
All right, there you go. Martin Short, so funny. And now it's time to get to my guest. She is the co-creator of The Daily Shows, the host of Feminist Buzzkills podcast, which drops every Friday. You can find her at Abortion Access Front, the organization that she created, and support them there because it's so important. And check out everything else that Liz is doing. All of the links are in the show notes. Follow her on social media and support her. Thank her for joining me uh, and for coming on the show. Listen to that podcast. I don't know what else I can tell you. I love Liz. Always great to catch up. We actually talked at the end of last week. So just in case uh, the new, the decision comes down on MTALA, abortion and emergency care, uh, we will have not have covered that yet if you're hearing this now. But Liz Winstead, let's do it. Oh, it's been way too long. I blame you. I blame you. I also blame patriarchy. (laughs) 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 I blame patriarchy as well. I'm so happy to see you. My as soon as you popped up on my screen, my heart filled with joy and excitement just to see you because you're such an amazing human being doing amazing human beings for your whole life. How are you doing? just trying to maintain, man. It just seems the world is on fire and here we are. And as we're in an election season, as abortions on the ballot, as there's people are so lost as to what the country is and scared as to what the country is. I'm glad to hear people talking about Project 2025. I'm glad to hear people seeing that there is a playbook that is This election isn't about Republicans against Democrats. It's Republicans against democracy. And it is terrifying. Did you think we would be here five years ago, 10 years ago? I knew that as people who had never had rights before uh, were forcing themselves to be at the table and demanding to expand access to all of us to just be part of the conversation and part of the decision making, that there would be blowback. because. When you have a system in place where you've created a power structure that is almost impossible to challenge, a lot of mediocre people are making decisions. And so when smart folks who never had a seat at that table are able to call them out, there's going to be reaction when you try to take someone's power away. That's scary. But I always thought it was, I didn't, I guess I didn't understand the profundity of what it means to retain power because women have had so little of it. That I don't think I could have woken up every day knowing that the goal was literally to, just in speaking for abortion, because there's so much to speak of, turn us into chattel culture and vessels with which to procreate. And it really, I don't say that like hyperbolically, it's what it is. And I, I don't think I could have done this fight had I known that what little value Mm. was placed on who we are. Are you losing energy or enthusiasm for the fight as a result? I'm not because I feel like every inch of the activism, when you bring people information, people act on it. Like, for example, us being on tour for next year will be our 10th anniversary of me running Abortion Access Front and us being on the ground and doing the work and helping grow these community activist spaces has helped those people mobilize to get ballot initiatives going. Right. So when I see that, I'm excited. Yeah. What scares me is the, there's a lot of people who, when they get the information, they still don't do anything about it. And that feels frightening. And also what scares me too, is that when we're just talking about abortion for the past 50 years, Democrats haven't really known how to talk about abortion. And now they've run away from it or taken talking points or thought they needed to be on the defensive. There was a lot of unlearning that needed to happen because I don't think a lot of us ever actually formulated our own thoughts around what reproductive rights and health and abortion mean. I think that we thought that it was, you know, we were literally the people for it, couching it in this sort of necessary evil language and stuff like that. And that just isn't, it's just not true. It doesn't do any good. And so now that abortion is literally on the ballot and the most popular thing on the ballot, more popular than any politician, I, my hope is that Democrats will talk to us, the activists who have actually changed hearts and minds by being on the ground instead of talking to each other 
in this class of chattering class of what do political consultants think? I don't care what you think. You have not helped. So talk to us. We can help you actually message accordingly. So I want to know who's talking to you and what you're telling them. But the we were talking a couple of days here before the anniversary of Dobbs decision that overturned Roe v. Wade. And it's not a celebration anniversary. You're not having any parties for uh, it. No. But I do want to ask you, as a result, in the last year, what have you, what have we lost? What have women lost? What have women in some states lost more than others? And and finally, my my kind of sarcastic, cynical take is that in the states where uh, some states have actually increased access to women's reproductive rights and covered it more with insurance and so on. In our states, in these kind of more liberal blue states or communities, we're far less worried uh, about it, it would seem. We're so much concerned about the thing right in front of us, no matter what our politics are. When it comes to abortion, I'm worried that we're not we're not concerned about it in the states where we feel like we still have access to all of it. So what have you seen change in the difference between the states and where you live? So I think a couple of things. First off, I want people to be clear that we got here under Roe v. Wade. So when you hear we need to restore Roe or we need to codify Roe, that's not enough. It's not enough because it left out so many people. When you hear these stories of these people in Texas who were turned away in emergency rooms or had later pregnancies that they wanted, a lot of those people wouldn't have been protected under Roe because the, the pregnancy was after the point of viability considered. And so I think that's one thing that I'd like to just put point out there that we need to do better than Roe. And that means getting abortion out of cr- any criminal code and also just making sure that the doctors and patients are talking and they're the ones talking because they're the ones who know every pregnancy is different. Pregnancies are like puberty. They're different for every person. You're a parent of more than one daughter, right? So you know that your wife's pregnancies were vastly different. Both, and they just yeah. are how you feel, how you do, yeah. how they go. But what I have seen, Pete, is there used to be all this fakey rhetoric that I never believed where it was like, you know, love them both. And we never want to punish a woman who's had an abortion. And the narrative has changed dramatically from even punishing doctors is hideous enough. Now it's incarcerate people who've had abortions and it's making not ever believing us ever not ever believing us when we're dying, not ever believing us when we're going to lose our fertility. And it's a whole lot of people with very little expertise now trying to create blanket situations where people have to literally be dying in a parking lot to get health care. And for the states who have experienced- that's not health care, that's emergency care. Yeah. But you don't get a pap smear in the parking lot. You don't get all kinds of preventative care checkups. If you're dying in the parking lot, it's because you didn't have health insurance, most likely, or access, right? It's that, no, it's that doctors turned you away because the laws have said they will throw you in jail. You have to, in many states, as a physician, either get permission ahead of time from a board of non-doctors and present to them evidence that this person is dying or you have to, or after the fact you have to defend your decision. So doctors are terrified to give people care. So they're sending people away, sending them in parking lots and literally until your vital organs start failing. And that is not just Texas. It is, Missouri, it is Tennessee, it's Idaho, it's Oklahoma. I could go on, but I won't. So that's where we're at. And as you and I speak today, I have chewed my fingers to the bone waiting for the second Supreme Court case that's coming down the pipe that a lot of people don't know about, which is there's a federal law. It's the Emergency Medical Treatment Act that was under, it came under Reagan that's that basically said EMTALA. EMTALA. Yeah. EMTALA is the acronym. And what it basically said was you can't dump patients out on the street if they don't have insurance. You have to stabilize anybody who comes into your emergency room 
but you have to give them stabilizing care. The state of Idaho says we have a total abortion ban and we don't, we think that we think we're in compliance with EMTALA by saying that our law that only protects the patient is dying is in compliance with EMTALA, which it's not. And so it's pretty fascinating how they tried to make the case that since abortion wasn't listed, that they didn't mean that abortion should be a procedure covered. And it's who would write a law that would cover every procedure? You would write a law if you didn't want abortion in, you would specifically exclude it because that's a shorter list. Well, I, I went to the emergency room last week uh, because my penis was bothering me. They got me right in. Yeah, turns out. This is a law that will, this is a case that will determine whether federal law protects pregnant people's right to emergency care. Also, whether or not, and in in the history of this country, federal law trumps state law. That has been the history of this country. And so if the Supreme Court rules, and a lot of the questions they were asking is, does do federal conscience clause laws trump EMTALA? And they do. uh, And the arguments? Yeah. And the physician, and the woman, Elizabeth Preliger, who is the Solicitor General, is a brilliant attorney. She also argued the Mifepristone case. And she said, always, and a physician, we, emergency rooms know in advance the physicians who have conscience clauses and make sure someone else is there to do that. No physician is ever forced to perform an abortion if they don't want to. So the real question is, and even Amy Coney Barrett and all of the other justices were like, it seems like you said that this is fine, but then there's a list of things that you said you would have to get a permission from some state body to weigh in and that you actually aren't concerned about protecting the reproductive care or the organs of a person, that you could reduce them to literally a hollow shell of flesh as long as they're alive. And so, you say it is. so this Mtala case, you're basically, you and your organization are basically on call We're talking on Thursday. It could have come down today. It could come down tomorrow or next week. What do you anticipate based on the arguments? What will your action be and how can all of us support you? So that is the real question, Pete, is it was Justices Alito and Thomas, but felt like they were very much not listening to the actual truth of the matter and did not really feel that airlifting patients out from an emergency room and not seeing them and airlifting them to a different state didn't fall, was not violating EMTALA, which I'm like, the whole point is dropping. You can't drop people off. Anyway, I don't know. And we don't know. What we do know is that there's a siren going off in my house. We do know that. But what we do know is that if they rule that state law can supersede federal law, that we have a, a new set of rules that coming down the pike of protections. What it says is that's it's really one of the only avenues we have on a federal level right now that can help protect abortion access in these extreme cases where people end up in the emergency room and that's it. So it, what we will work on if they rule in our favor, it's good. We move forward, right? It's, We have to expand access. Like we cannot have bureaucracy standing in the way of pregnancy. If they say bureaucracy gets to stand in the way, it should be a wake up call to everyone, the Democratic Party and activists to say, this is why states' rights don't work. This is why abortion needs to be something that is an unquestionable civil right and human right in the United States of America. And how do we do that? Expand the court, I guess. That'll be a lot harder than winning in November. And yeah. the issue in, and only could happen if Joe Biden wins in, in November. Yeah. And probably still won't happen, but yeah. it's the only you choice. Know, but this court, I don't know what to say. I just well, Let me I, ask you just quickly about this court. What do you want to say about Samuel Alito? I, I've been surprised to see that you actually like and respect the man, Liz. What am I missing? Oh, yeah, I love him. You know what? He's been really excellent. I heard you just, you like him. He's good at cooking and, and you see his best qualities. Yeah, 
I would like to fly my prolapsed uterus over his house. <laughs> you want to take your prolapsed uterus and put it on his flagpole? Is that what I mean? Fly it upside down so he can understand. I'm not even sure what that means. Like but, he would um, know or anybody that it was upside down. Like, that uterus is upside down. Or what is that? What is that? What letter? What Greek letter is that? I'm unclear <laughs> like most of them. Uh, uh, it really does feel at this point, we heard the the tapes from of Alito just being like, yeah, we need nothing from him. Already said way more extreme things publicly. I know it's wild, but I feel like this court is they ruled to to keep mifepristone as it is the abortion medication only because the people who brought the case were such crackpots that they couldn't even justify them having no one's coming to you. You've never performed abortions. You don't have to perform abortions. You have no standing in this case. Be gone. There was nothing else they could rule because it was absurd. It would be like a bunch of plumbers that say, we do deal with pipes, so we're pissed. It was ludicrous. Yeah. Uh, Let's talk, uh, though, about the issue. I just keep thinking that the issue that you're an expert on, that you're an advocate for women's reproductive rights, more specifically abortion, it it should be the only issue for a lot of voters. It should animate a lot of people. But you, you see all these pundits and consultants who understand that saying that there's not being enough said or enough like people are forgetting. And so there has to be sustained campaigns to remind people every day what women have lost and what more they could lose. How do you feel like the issue, you're doing the best in the country at it, you and your podcast and your organization, obviously you do it all day, all the time and have for years. But how do you think the rest of the entire media infrastructure or political infrastructure is doing in the 100 and what, 30 days or whatever it is left between now and the election on just beating the hell out of this issue? Because I think there should be ads every day of terrible consequences of women who have lost these rights in states across the country. Birth control, IVF, it's all a package, right? It is literally, if you think it's about only about abortion, it's about who gets to control their bodies and who doesn't. The other thing I would say is, and this is an unpopular opinion, I do think that laying a bunch of this on the feet of Donald Trump is fine, but we all have a role to play in how we got here. And if you say Donald Trump did this, it's really abdicating the responsibility of all of us. I cannot tell you, Pete, and we actually I can because we've talked about it a bunch. Since I started this fight and started this organization in 2025, 15, Obama, it was like I started this during Obama. And these things were happening when I was really started. There wasn't Trump. And there was Democrats saying it's a wedge issue. It isn't a primary thing that anybody cares about. And Roe will never be overturned. The year that they overturned Roe, I had people saying, it's never happening. Why are you being, you're just trying to raise money for your organization. And I said, I'm on the road in these states. I've been to 35 states extensively, working with the activists, seeing who their legislators are that got elected, seeing what's happening. And it was an alarm bell I just wanted people to talk about because they were, it was a trend and people like, who cares what's happening in Oklahoma and Missouri? I'm like, because it's also happening in Idaho, in all these States. And so I think that the biggest mistake people are making is not talking to the storytellers and the advocates who have helped people on a journey to talk to politicians about abortion access so that they hear from their constituents. I think it's important. I think this, we've talked to many of the women who are who are plaintiffs in these lawsuits that we've seen, and their stories are tragic. But the truth is, even they say, we were lucky enough to have access to lawyers and the media. Right. When the fact of the matter is, poor black and brown people and rural people are the ones who are affected the most by these laws, and they don't have access. And they're the ones who get incarcerated for these things. And they're the ones who don't have, we saw in Ohio, This poor black woman who went to a Catholic hospital three times saying, I'm having a miscarriage, help me. And then they turned her away and she had a miscarriage at home in her toilet and got arrested. So it's it's, we're here. We've arrived at the beginnings of a Christian nationalist Gilead. Louisiana's got the Ten Commandments in the schools. You got Christian nationalists running the house. You've got Donald Trump as the nominee, 
And obviously, you've got this Supreme Court, which we've talked about. I don't know how else to, to frame it out or the stakes <laughs> as where they're at. Who's not yeah. listening to you in the Democratic Party? Is there someone in between you and the and policymakers or strategy that I you would say that I would say that it, there's very few providers or people working on the ground in from the president, from the vice president, from anybody who's asking us to help them craft messaging. Part of that could be that Joe Biden personally does not support abortion. His Catholicism informs him in a different way. And it's really hard to be an advocate if your religion does that. Although there's great organizations like Catholics for Choice who we could talk to who are doing incredible work. And so I feel like that's really hard. And he's doing the best he can. I think that he's advocating for the abortions he can accept in his heart. And Mm -hmm. I think that can be a little bit of a detriment to the larger scope of how you're advocating. I think, Joe, that the, the, I think though that the advocates out there really just, I wish they'd just talk to us because we could give them compassionate talking points that do a reframe Um, because one in four women have had an abortion in their reproductive lifetime. That's one in four people with a story to tell. And that's one in four people who understand that um, that was something that they needed to do. And there's a myriad of emotion that goes along with it. But if your life puts you back on a path to know how you can parent, how your life can be better, what you need to do for whatever your circumstance is, which is nobody's business, by the way, those stories can be powerful and I think should be told. I wish that come talk to me. We're here. Come talk to us. And everybody can learn more about you because I didn't know this, but there's been these documentary filmmakers that have been following you and your organization, your colleagues around for seven years. Yes. And now they are out with this new documentary that's being screened at, screened at film festivals. No one asked you. Go to no one asked you doc.com to see where it's being screened. What, what can you tell me about? This, let me just read it. Comedian, disruptor extraordinaire Liz Winstead, co-creator of The Daily Show, and her team Abortion Access Front crisscross the U.S. to support abortion clinic staff and bust stigma. Pop culture icons, next-gen comics feel this six-year road film activating small-town folks to rebuild vandalized clinics, exposing wrongdoer politicians, domestic terrorists, and media neglect as the race to the bottom ensues. A bold call to action reminds us. Uh, that when the patriarchy burns down, joy will prevail. This looks amazing. And you just told me about it. I haven't even watched a trailer for it, but what can you tell people where to see it? And obviously I mentioned the, the website. So it's on the film festival circuit right now. So it just came out starting next week on Monday is the official anniversary. Or, or, we're calling it the overturn anniversary of Roe. It's screening in a bunch of different cities at no one asked you doc.com. You can see where, and then if you just sign up for their mailing list, They'll send it to you when it's coming to a town near you. You can also follow the Abortion Front social media. We'll keep you up to date on everything. There's a nice article in Vanity Fair that just dropped half an hour ago just about the documentary and about everything. Yeah, so it's pretty awesome. So check that out and check out our work. If you're feeling like, what do I do, Liz? How can I help? Go to aafront.org and hit join us and we'll put you to work. We can, because it's, we just feel like marching is the first step. It's a, if you want to create a movement then and you have some skills, but you don't know how to apply them, we'll help you do that. There you go. Liz, you are the very best. I'm so glad I got to talk to you today. And I Me promise too. you it won't be long before we do it again. Thank you I so much. It. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, there she goes. Liz Winstead, Abortion Access Front, Feminist Buzzkills, live the podcast. Go listen. Go subscribe. Go support her. Thank her for joining me here on the show. Always, always so great. I'm so happy that she joined me, and I hope that I'll get her back here on the show, but definitely go support her work. That's all I've got for you. Like I said, tomorrow's show might be late. It might not be. We'll see. I'm going to uh, work hard on making it all happen, but I'll be at a conference, and, uh, well, we'll see. Be patient with me. Thank you so much, you guys, for your support. Can't wait to see you at our uh, debate party, watch party, and uh, our hangout tomorrow night. Look for the link. And that's it. That's all I got for you. I'm going to wrap it up right now. John Carroll, take us out. JohnCarroll.org, everybody. Go support him. Hey, you've been sitting so long. You got the creep. He needs you. Got to stand up. Stand up. I think you're driving wheels in a leak and grease. Boy, you better stand up. Stand up. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right. The 
keep right on ignoring us if it keeps in sight. You got to open up the window to let in some light. You got to stand up. That's right. You got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eye. For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws and since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up stand oh, up you got to stand up oh, come on just stand up everybody got to stand up in the darkest hour stand up keep your God power stand up come on come on come on Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, stand.